So with that, um, let me uh, introduce the workshop for today and the workshop leader. So the workshop is on um, uh, Beyond Ableism, How to Be Good Autistic Allies. And um, Sarah Douglas will lead us in that. Sarah has pre-recorded uh, the, the main uh, sessions or the main parts of the workshop. So we will uh, use those pre-recordings so she can save all her energy to, to chat with you in the chat box or, or respond to other questions uh, later. Um, there are three um, sessions of about, or, or parts of about 10 minutes. After each of these three 10-minute uh, sessions, we will have a uh, five-minute um, time for, for reflection, for your personal reflection, for which you can use your research journal. Then after an hour, we will have a break. And uh, then we will have a breakout group of about 25 minutes. And uh, then we have about 25 minutes, 30 minutes for Q&A with Sarah. So that's the outline for today. And then Sarah. Um, Sarah sent a long uh, bio uh, by way of introduction. Uh, introduction. Um, I simply don't have time to repeat everything that's there. Um, but I think I will do justice to Sarah by saying that she um, has been involved uh, in by, sorry, has been involved in an advisory capacity with a number of research projects at the University of Bristol, and at other places. She is also actively involved with Autistica, a charity that funds and campaigns for autism research. Sarah received her diagnosis of autism as an adult woman, and uh, she writes that that diagnosis was a real game changer for her. And she is now keen to, contrib to contribute to research and other projects from, from her experience of an autistic woman. Sarah, feel free to add anything you want to say by way of introduction uh, now or at another point. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's, it's really a pleasure to welcome you here and to have you as speaker for our first uh, session. And we look forward to um, you sharing your wisdom with us. So if there is nothing to add at this point, um, let me invite David to start the first pre-recorded session. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you, Leon, for that uh, lovely introduction. So welcome to uh, Beyond Ableism, How to Be Good Autistic Allies. May I have the next slide, please, David? OK, well, to start with, I think, uh, you know, a good place to start is with a, a general definition. So ableism is a form of discrimination or social prejudice against individuals with disabilities. Next slide, please, David. And to broaden the definition, ableism is discrimination or oppression against minority disabled groups or individuals in favour of the uh, majority of people uh, who are able-bodied or who do not have mental or neurodevelopmental conditions. It's always dehumanising and othering. And in the context of autism, ableism is discrimination or oppression against autistic people in favour of the majority neurotypical population or if you prefer, the predominant neurotype, or PNT. Next slide, please, David. OK. So ableism, in, a, in the context of autism, it can manifest itself in many ways. Um, predominantly, it's, a, it's an attitude or a belief that autistic people are inferior or somehow abnormal or are broken, need fixing, or... Uh, <laughs> your autism needs praying away. I've had that one before. Um, and it usually sort of um, plays into the medical model of deficit. So research, autism research that kind of like emphasises the medical model generally aims at sort of like cure or prevention, which the vast majority of autistic people really don't want. Um, what we want is understanding and acceptance. And the, the UK uh, Autism Research Charity, Autistica, in 2016, produced a report, uh, one of the stats from it, which says 44% of UK research funding in 2016 was spent on animal studies, which play an important role in the research and on the cause and cure for autism. That's a huge chunk of money to be spent on what the majority of the autism community would consider to be eradication. Ableism and autism context can also be a disregard for the needs or abilities of autistic people. 
um, it can ignore or not understand our sensory sensitivities or undersensitivities. It can um, it can uh, not understand or disregard that you know, it's often a hidden disability. We don't look autistic, um, and so therefore people don't. They can assume what that you don't need any help, or that um, if you have maybe high support needs, you can't do anything. Um, and it kind of it disregards sort of the length and breadth and amazing diversity that there is in autism. And we often have what is known as spiky profiles, uh, which means that generally we can be you know, very good at some things and not so good at others. And so we need help with different stuff. Um, it's not quite as straightforward as people often think. Ableism can also be individual or structural and systemic. Um, I've worked in workplaces where there are very much a lack of reasonable adjustments. Um, access to services such as health services can be very, very difficult. For example, if you, um, the only way you can contact your GP is via the phone. A lot of autistic people find that really, really hard to do. Um, and trying to access events like gigs or, you know, the theatre or performances, incredibly difficult as well, because you you have to jump through an awful lot of hoops to prove that you are disabled or need support, particularly if, um, again, you have fairly low support needs and uh, organisations often look at you as if you think, well, you're just, you know, you're, you're lying, basically. So there's this real sort of like, you know, difficulty with a lot of systems that are in place. Now, ableism can also, you know, it can be unconscious. Most people don't set out to be horrible or bullying. Um, and it can be accidental, but then it can be deliberate or intentional. And you see a lot of explicit hate crimes like make crime or bullying. But it can also be very subtle um, in sort of social messages that are sort of like put out there. Things like inspiration porn, you know, disabled or autistic people trotted out to sort of like um I mean, in some ways almost make people feel better about themselves and um we haven't got time to go into the complete abomination that was the the seer offering of music earlier on this year last year i'm afraid um but uh, maybe you can have a look at that in the q and a's now ableism can also be hiding in plain sight um there are certain um, autism organizations that the majority of autistic people really do not like. We do not like the things they say about us or the messages they send out. And also there are what we call autism industries. So things like ABA, which is applied behavior analysis or um, <laughs> bleach cures, um, things like that, that you know are really peddled. A lot of people make money out of this kind of thing, but actually the autistic community hate them. And on a serious note as well, ableism in the autism context can be internalised. So people who are, you know, autistic people um, can absorb all this stuff that society sort of like throws out and it influences your own behaviour. So it can result in a lot of poor mental health, you know, self-hatred, a lot of shame. You can gaslight yourself. It's, it's a real problem. Um, and, you know, these things are things that would be useful to be aware of for your own research studies. And also, very importantly, um, ableism is very intersectional with the other protected characteristics such as racism, sexism, sexism homophobia and uh, transphobia. So that's a little oversight, a little um, insight into what it, um, ableism can be in the autism field. David, can you have next uh, slide, please? OK, so uh, we finished the first section of the workshop. What I'd like you to do now is we're going to, we're going to organise breakout rooms for you. And um, if you can uh, get out your journals and we're going to do an exercise, I'd like you to just have a little think about these two questions. So the first one is, how aware were you of the concept of ableism before this session? And uh, you know, what are your thoughts about ableism, particularly in relation to the autistic lived experience? OK, does that make sense? And uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. So what we're going to do now is uh, the second part of the workshop, which is how to be a good autism research ally. Um, now, these are a few ideas that um, I put cobbled together myself um, with a few um, sort of like um, pointers from uh, other research books. But um, it's not definitive. These are just ideas. And I'm sure you'll be able to think of an awful lot of stuff yourself. All right. Now, the first thing that um, 
is really important is you need to know your stuff. You need to immerse yourself in autistic history, culture, experiences. I have made a, a short list of autistic people and researchers on Twitter to follow to accompany these slide notes, um, but they are suggestions only. There's an awful lot of information out there, and so it can be a bit overwhelming, but it might be a good starting point for you. Um, another thing I would recommend, actually, is the Steve Silverman book, Neurotribes, which it, it, he's not autistic himself, but he has a really good understanding. And um, it's a book that is highly recommended within the community as well. So that's a really good um, starting point as well. OK, so the second thing I would suggest is try and use disability models and autism theories that are you know, more acceptable to the autistic community um, you know, to underpin your research. So things like, you know, go for a social disability model rather than the medical model, um, opt for the neurodiversity paradigm rather than ideas of abnormality or deficit or, you know, have a look at ideas like monotropism or the double empathy problem rather than sort of like focusing on things like the trial of impairments and theory of mind. OK, um, and this is really important, you know, try and conduct research that allows autistic voices and stories to be heard, you know, because this will help us thrive throughout our lifespan. Um, now, in, in 2016, uh, from the Autistical Report, only 27 percent of total UK autism research funding was actually spent on the community's you know, top 10 research priorities. You know, we care about things like well-being, health, employment, social care and services. We're not that that keen on experiments and mice. So, um, you know, try and try and focus on the stuff that the community really wants to know about. Um, yes, go have next slide, please, David. Thank you. So also include as many autistic voices as you can, um, you know, particularly from groups that are underrepresented, such as you know, autistic people of colour, you know, autistic people with a learning disability, older autistic people non-speaking autistic people and I think adolescents don't get much of a look in either so that yeah it's another important underrepresented group um between 15 and 40 percent of autistic people have learning disabilities but according to the 2016 report only three studies recruited people with a learning disability um 47 percent of funding went to children rather than three percent going to adults over 50 which is somebody who's 51 that you know that's not great is it um and only two studies recruited people with few or no words. Um, these, are, these are not great statistics. But I think the worst one is that in this study, in this, sorry, in this report, there is no mention of any research into the experiences of autistic people of colour. Now, to me, that's big volumes. And we need to do better. Next slide, please, David. OK, so. Um, yeah, involve autistic people at every stage of the research process, you know, both diagnosed and self-diagnosed. Um, it's really hard to get a diagnosis in the UK. Waiting times are horrendous, often up to about three years. So a lot of people are self-diagnosing. They're finding out, they're, you know, they're touching base with the community and they're investigating their own neurotype. And so they're self-diagnosing. And a lot of us feel that it's actually as valid to self-diagnose as to actually have an official diagnosis because you want to be inclusive. Um, I think it's also really important to be aware of the balance of power. This little chart here, uh, the stuff you need to avoid is the stuff at the bottom. So step away from coercing, assessing, educating, informing, consulting, engaging, yep, getting better. But what we want to aim for is either co-designing, co-producing or community controlled. Um, yeah. Uh, autism research nirvana is community controlled awful participation of autistic people all right and it's um, my experience of um, being involved in uh, autism studies it's 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 a brilliant opportunity to share expertise from you know across the uh, the autism community but also people who aren't autistic but who really care about autistic people so it's you know it's a really good um you know collaboration next slide please david OK, so um, two research heroes of mine, uh, Sue Fletch Watson and uh, Francesca Happy, have uh, put together a few ideas for, you know, ideas how you can um, include autistic people uh, in every stage of your project cycle. So they suggested um, at the formulating ideas stage, you know, spend time with autistic people, you know, befriend, volunteer. I would say get on Twitter and use the asking autistics hashtag because that's really um, 
you know, that that's a really good one to use if you want to ask respectful questions. Um, hashtags like actually autistic or all autistic, that is just for the community, but use this one and it, uh, you'll, you'll get some uh, good interaction, I should think. When you're writing a grant, um, you know, talk informally to autistic people you know, do online surveys and also include costing to autistic consultancy and, ad um, and advisors. Really important to pay people for their um, expertise and their time. Um, involve, recommend £20 per hour for advisors. Um, I've been involved in studies which uh, offer £10 vouchers for participants. You can use Amazon vouchers as well, which um, or any other kind of vouchers, because that gets around things like um, if people are on benefits, it doesn't interfere with their benefits um, payouts. Um, when you're recruiting a study team, um, you could consider having an autistic uh, representative on your interview panel. Now, the Strata project that I'm involved in at Bristol University, um, this year we had an interview for... Um, a senior research associate and I was on the panel as an equal panel member as an autistic person and it's the first time in Bristol University's history they've done this so it's really quite groundbreaking but it's it's a really good way to get autistic people involved right from the word go. Um, also when you're designing materials so you know review them have your have your focus groups and your advisory groups that are, you know full of autistic people review them um, you know, look at things like contrast, font, layout, uh, language, which we'll talk more about later, as well as content. Um, all these things matter because um, autistic people will probably most likely have co-occurring conditions, say like dyslexia or dyscalculia. And, um, you know, things like uh, fonts and layouts are really, really important for our, to help our understanding. And there's ways of writing things like uh, maybe using easy read or you know, making sure that the colours um, that highlight particular things, there's a real continuity with it, so it doesn't become overwhelming, and you know, preferably not too busy. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but that's a little Strata logo that um, we uh, we ended up uh, agreeing on for um, the Strata study. Um, it's something that, as a, the autistic panel, we absolutely loved it. Um, so we chose that one, and that's the one they've gone with, which is lovely. Um, I've also been involved in um, slightly random, but sort of like working out the acronyms for um, studies. Now, um, there's a study I'm involved in, which is a side a side project, is a started project called Apricots. Um, it's about autistic people and randomised control trials. So I got my head my head in gear and uh, worked out Apricots for that one. And there's another one which is. Um, understanding and helping autistic and non-autistic people who self-harm, which is not very snappy. So I came up with a Upanishads. We're not quite sure if we're going to go with that because most people have no idea what the Upanishads are unless you're a um, religious studies uh, student. Anyway, um, so when um, when you do your data collection with your participants, you know, if it's face to face, you know, make sure you check the space that, they, that, that people are going to be in, autistic people are going to be there, um, you know, sitting in. Make sure you do a sensory review. Is the light too bright? Um, you know, is it too warm? Is it too cold? Are there drafts? Is it too noisy? You know, check for disrespectful posters. Um, and also you know, invite feedback on the experience. That's always a good thing to do because then you can learn for future projects as well. Um, the Strata project, uh, the PPI group, um, focus group, we're um, we're going to be doing um, interviewing training, sorry, interview training for the actual, um, not not the participants, but for the actual researchers so that um, they can have an idea of possibly the kind of responses that autistic people will give. So we're fully involved in all that as well. And also dissemination, you know, make sure you thank participants, you know, keep them informed. There's lots of things you can do to share as creatively, widely and openly as you can. Um, Twitter autistic community, we're always we're always up for information. Um, but also, you know, offer participants the opportunity to register interest in your papers, you know, offer preprints, open access, which is a great thing, or you know, offer to send PDFs if open access is not available. Um, you know, have newsletters, um, know, dedicated websites. Um, I know some of the projects I'm involved in, we're we're planning PPI workshops and co-presentation. Um and also, you know, PPI controlled social media communications and also conference invitations. Um, I'm off to the INSAR next week, virtually, sadly, it's in Boston this year, but um, so 
that is virtual to um, be involved in a poster presentation there. And it, yeah, it's fantastic to be involved at all these different levels. So David, yes, can I have the next slide please? Okay, so make sure your study is designed around the accommodations and adjustments that your autistic participants and, you, and your advisory groups need. Um, so a study I'm doing at the moment is called the Autism Adapted Safety Plan. It's to do with suicide, self-harm and the safety plans associated with it. Now, the website, which is dedicated for it, has you know, very clear, well laid out information about all aspects of the study, you know, about funders, timelines, you know, partners, any support you might need, pictures of the team, that kind of thing. And it's really useful to have visual and concrete reminders of what the studies are involving, because autistic people often have problems with uh, executive function, working memory. Um, overwhelm and prosopagnosia, which is sort of like uh, an inability to recognise faces in different contexts, that kind of thing. So it's really helpful. It helps. I, I definitely find my anxiety, sorry, my anxiety levels are much more reduced when I have all this kind of information here. It's just the right balance. It's not too much, so it's overwhelming, but it's just enough so that you know what's going on and you feel confident in what you're doing. Um, Sarah Casty, who is also another brilliant autism researcher, um, she's doing a self-harm study and her communication always includes you know, helpful travel directions, um, including you know, photos of where you need to go, sending agendas in advance, don't leave stuff to the last minute because it absolutely freaks us out, um, you know, visual guides of the research space and psychology department, that sort of thing, really helpful. So there's a couple of links there. Um, that information just so you can have a look to see what other researchers do because it's really helpful. Um, Rachel Mosley, um, she's an actually autistic uh, researcher and uh, lecturer at uh, Bournemouth University and she's doing she's done some amazing stuff into uh, menopause and her current stuff is on self-harm and suicide. <laughs> a bit of a theme here isn't it? Um, Anyway, her Coltrick uh, survey online it's a it's absolutely brilliant it's a really good example of careful consistent design it uses simple black and white images to you know illustrate what what each question is about large fonts in green and uses green which is a very lovely restful color for highlighting key concepts there are two very clear breakpoints and you know three much more manageable parts it's, it's very well structured there's also opportunities for open text answers so participants can um yeah, they can add extra information, um, you know, and these are regularly offered throughout the study. And there's also a helpful percentage bar so the participants can see where they, you know, what progress they've made. Always useful to know where you're headed. Um, autistic people do find uncertainty very difficult. So that's a really nice little touch, I think. Um, there's a COVID-19 supplement to the Apricot study, which is what we're doing the, um, the poster presentation on. Um, and it actually indicates that virtual study participation is preferable uh, for autistic people. And it would actually encourage autistic to take part in studies. So maybe that's something to bear in mind as well when you are designing your um, focus groups and um, your actual uh, data gathering techniques is to, you know, maybe think along those lines. It also save an awful lot of money, I should imagine, as well. But, um, you know, it's actually, it does seem that autistic people do prefer this kind of approach. Next slide, please, David. Thank you. And this is really important. Um, it's really important to be aware that autistic people are more likely than PNT, uh, this PNT populace, to identify as LB, LGBTQIA, either gender diverse or non-binary. And it's really important reflect, to reflect this when designing your participation questionnaires. So instead of saying male, female, other, or do not want to disclose or something like that, offer a range of gender identities or you know, invite participants to self-identify, you know, ask what their preferred pronouns are, be respectful and mindful that you are stepping into somebody else's worldview, which may be different from your own, okay? And uh, Rachel Mosley, um, this is an example from the Poultrick study, um, and it gives a really good example of how to do it really well. Okay, so next slide please. David, thank you. Right, okay, so I've been training to be a counsellor. I'm in the middle of my training at the moment. And actually, 
your own personal qualities as a researcher are really important and i would i would suggest investing time in developing them um because autistic people are much more likely to have experienced very deeply entrenched lifelong and multiple traumas and um you know we often have either complex ptsd or ptsd and a lot of co-occurring mental health conditions now you know, you're a researcher you're not a counselor but you are going to be working with generally a vulnerable and marginalized group of people who you know for pretty good reason do find trusting people hard so you will need to be relational empathic and genuine and you'll have to have good listening skills um really important to be person-centered obviously you know every person who's autistic is very different to everybody else and um, so tailor it to that person be non-judgmental and be self-reflective practitioners and obviously be play, you know particularly sensible um, sensitive if you're you know you're designing studies about difficult life experiences you know a lot of the research is done about stuff like eating disorders sexual domestic violence bullying mate crime self-harm suicide and as you can imagine being asked questions about this can be incredibly difficult and often re-traumatizing and it can leave participants very feeling very vulnerable but also be aware that what is traumatic for one person may not be for another and vice versa so um yeah person-centered non-judgmental self-reflective and aware um Rachel Mosley's uh, Quartric study, it's absolutely steeped in a sense of duty of care towards the um, participant, sorry, participant. <laughs> it's non-judgmental and it's empathic um, and it gives several opportunities to leave the study. And it's backed up with layers of reassurance, support and signposting. And a really good thing she's put in as well is there's an automa automated support message, which is generated if participants give responses that, you know, give the researchers cause for concern. And warnings are also given before entering the most sensitive parts of the study. And there are regular pit stops and check-ins with puppies and ducks. Next picture, please, David. Thank you. Puppies, there you go. Um, next slide, please, David. Thank you. And also, you know, very importantly, um, be aware of your own emotional processing and, you know, make your own self-care a priority. Um, Dr. Felicity Sedgwick is a... Um, lecturer and researcher at Bristol University. We work together and um, we've done a, um, a study on sexual victimization. We're also writing a book together on relationships, but this is what um, Rachel, I'm oh, sorry, what Felicity is focusing on here. And she says, you know, I've often felt wrung out at the end of interviews, very emotional and exhausted and trying to hide that from the person I'm talking to. And what I've learned is that I need to look after myself in doing this research as well as looking after my participants, otherwise, I can end up in a not great place and also the research suffers because I'm not able to give it my all. So what Felicity recommends is I mean, she takes time between interviews or between the interview and transcription stage. You know, she follows each interview with dedicated time for self-care because they have been harrowing, to be fair. Um, and she offloads offlo to you know, a supportive partner or friends. So self-care is crucial. No one told me I could or needed to do it during my PhD, and I wish they had, rather than me learning the hard, the hard way. So, next slide, please, David. Okay, but also don't forget to have fun. You know, take time to enjoy the research process. You know, celebrate your wins because you'll have lots of them as well as difficulties. You'll have lots of wins. Appreciate the people you meet along the way, and you know, remember you're part of something really important here. You're helping to build a research family. And from what I understand about Aberdeen, um, particularly, that, that it's very much that feel is that you are a family and um, and that's really important. I think you get the best out of people if you've, um, you've got good relations with people. Be civilised, you know, cafes and pubs, you know, they make planning meetings convivial and fun and always include cake. This is a this is a selection of the cake that I brought along to one of our strata meetings. Um, we're all very fat now, but there we are. Anyway, next slide, please, David. Okay, so we've got to the end of the second section. Sorry, a bit of a whiz through. There's just a lot of information there. Um, so if you could do another journal exercise, you'll go back into your groups. And uh, the question I'd like you to have a look at is, um, how can my study help to be a good ally? Thanks very much. Welcome back again. So the third part of the workshop I'd like to have a look at is language and ableist language because this is a huge part of 
um, studies into autism and to any studies really but it, it's the language you use that can have a massive massive impact it's one thing that you can everybody can do better at or be aware of the things that are needed or not needed so um i've given you a um a study which we're going to go through a little bit of later on avoiding ableist language suggestions for autism researchers and i've got a quote here from it which i think sums up the whole thing really language is a powerful means for shaping how people view autism if researchers take steps to avoid ableist language researchers service providers and society at large may become more accepting and accommodation, accommodating of autistic people. And ultimately, this is what we want. We want acceptance, we want accommodations, and we want understanding, and we want to be able to live our best lives. So, you know, if as researchers, you want to be part of that change of narrative about disability and autism, you know, the way you treat your participants and communicate with your um, autistic study participants and co-producers and the way you write about them, the way you disseminate your research findings, it's hugely important and influential. You know, your work really matters and the way you do the way you do it matters as well. Next slide, please, David. OK, so this is what we're looking at. Next slide, please. OK, so I've just selected a, a few slides from uh, a few examples from the study because um, there's a lot of information and it's too much to go through today. Now, I was talking earlier on about the, the medical model and the language that the medical model uses really emphasizes um, <laughs> the abnormality of autistic people. It, it kind of like construes people as either being healthy or sick. And autistic people, disabled people with the medical model go very much into the, the sick category. Um, and this is very, very damaging. And, and it, you know, it really perpetrates negative stereotypes. And um, for example, I mentioned theory of mind earlier on. You know, and the theory of mind originally was really intended to um, talk about or try and understand how autistic people think, their cognitive processes. But it became conflated um, into including um, aspects of humanity like empathy and understanding. And that's really unhelpful because if the theory sort of positions autistic people as lacking empathy it it dehumanizes us because it makes us other and if we if by definition we lack certain aspects of humanity it can also le um, lead to questions of to well can we make our own decisions can we have our own autonomy and again it results in stigma and misunderstanding and difficulties for the community and is very unhelpful next slide please david Thank you. As opposed to the social model, which some people think that the social model um, makes autism out to be all singing, all dancing, and everything's all lovely in the meadow. And that's not actually what it does. What it does, it does, it does um, emphasise that there are disabilities um, with people who are autistic or you know have other co-occurring conditions. But what it what it does say is that um it is society which disables rather than it being the fault of the autistic person that autistic person doesn't need fixing but what but the society in which we live does um you know and it emphasizes the idea of difference but it still upholds the idea that you know disability is part of you know the human makeup it is part of our neurodiversity it is part of the diversity of brains um, in the same way that um, biodiversity, uh, you know, encapsulates the, the wonderful diversity of uh, flora and fauna in the world. And a good example of um, language that the social model encourages is the double empathy problem, which instead of focusing on communication deficits, which the medical model does, and um, you know, states pretty much that autistic people's communication skills are lacking because they are not the norm in society. The double empathy problem suggests that actually, autistic people find non-autistic people just as confusing, and actually, 
um, it's a two way street. So instead of saying autistic people are lacking, it's saying, well, you know, we need to learn from each other. And that's the best, that's the, you know, the, the way we learn and the, the, the way we get the best out of each other and the way society will work better is if we understand each other. OK, so be very aware of your own, you know, your own communication style when you're doing your um, studies. You know, are you allowing for differences in um, processing time or um, I don't know, sort of, yeah, different communication styles or I can't see actually because the room. Um, hang on. Or um, studies or communicating with your participants or, you know, um, advisory groups. You know, be very aware of your own communication styles. Um, are you allowing for differences in processing time or differences in expression or receiving verbal language? You know, check in, check these things out with your participants and advisors. You know, ask, don't assume. All right. Um, next slide, please. OK, um, I'm not going to go through all of these because these are actually in the um, in the, uh, the paper. But examples of patronising language. Special interests. OK, so let's try things like areas of interest or expertise, focused or intense or passionate interests. Or then this is quite a big one in the community. Person first language, i.e. person with autism, can be seen as very patronising. And the preferred alternatives are identity first language, as in an autistic person or on the autism spectrum. But I have to say, I would add that actually a lot of people don't like on the autism spectrum either. So I'd stick with autistic personally. Um, yeah, next slide, please. OK, um, yeah, avoid the medicalised deficit based language. So um, things like at risk for ASD. Um, we don't like ASD because it's disorder. Go for ASC condition um, and, you know, Think of things like in using increased likelihood of autism or having, you know, the chances of having autism. Um, instead of comorbid, use co-occurring. Um, yeah, so treatment, support services, educational strategies, that kind of thing. OK, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, ableist discourse, uh, discourses, yeah, things like um, avoid anything to do with autism relating to a puzzle. Step away from the puzzle pieces, people. Go for the um, infinity symbol or, you know, consider it in the um, context of autism as, um, as part of neurodiversity. All right. Um, avoid cure, recovery, optimal outcome rhetorics and focus in instead on discussions that focus on uh, quality of life outcomes or pri that prioritise what autistic people want themselves. OK, next slide, please. OK, so that's the end of that section. I know it was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Uh, but as I say, we can um, we can go through stuff in more detail later. OK, so um, this is the final journal exercise, I think. Um, how can I avoid ableist language in my study? Um, I'm hoping that you've been able to read the information beforehand. If you haven't, just throw a few ideas out in your in your groups now and we'll We'll come back together in the main group in a little while. Thank you very much.